इन्हें कर दिया है ये ना Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin the session. First, I would like to seek your cooperation in completing this seminar. Kindly mute your audio and turn off your videos to avoid any interruption. You will have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the chat box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will collect the same and address them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. We shall begin today's session with a small video. I request architect Siddharth sir to play the video. The way we gather and consume the energy needed for our buildings and infrastructure is changing fast. Fossil fuel demand is declining while renewables are more widespread than ever and look set to rise further. But while we might be generating it more cleanly, reducing the amount of energy we use without heavily disrupting our lives is another challenge altogether. With buildings a huge contributor to carbon emissions, solutions in this area are becoming ever more critical as we work towards a zero carbon future. But some projects have already reached a goal that until recently would have seemed far too ambitious, creating more energy than they use through state-of-the-art technology. This is how buildings can power our world. As populations have increased, many countries have turned to cleaner energy to meet greater power requirements. Renewable production is now expanding quicker than expected, driven by huge growth in low-cost solar power and an upsurge in wind and hydroelectric projects. This shake-up of the global energy system is crucial to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving air quality, expanding access to cleaner energy and hitting carbon targets. None of this would be possible without the efforts of the construction industry. But while it's imperative that this transition continues, it's arguably more important that we focus our efforts on how to reduce the amount of energy we use as well. With buildings responsible for around 40% of greenhouse gas emissions, new solutions are needed to make them more efficient, transforming the way that new and established structures are designed, built and operated. Our buildings and the process of constructing them are responsible for more than a third of the world's overall energy consumption too, and this looks set to rise further in the future. However, despite being one of the largest contributors to emissions and energy usage, the building sector holds the potential to tackle these problems. Several buildings and projects already exist that show the incredible feats that can be achieved with energy efficient practices today, with technology and clever use of design playing a key role. Officially unveiled on Earth Day in 2013, the six-storey Bullet Centre in Seattle was designed to be the greenest commercial building in the world. It features 575 rooftop solar panels capable of generating 30% more energy than the building uses, which is then sold back to the grid, making it a positive energy building. The panels also funnel rainwater inside where it's filtered for drinking. All waste is processed on site and it's made entirely from locally sourced, non-toxic materials. Hong Kong's Zero Carbon Building is another example, using 45% less energy than similar buildings of a traditional design. 
The three-storey structure in Kowloon Bay is also equipped with 80 different eco-building technologies, including thousands of sensors that record and monitor environmental parameters. These feed into a building management system which analyzes and optimizes energy performance. But while these projects now highlight what can be achieved with energy efficient new builds, our existing structures must also be taken into account. With around 80% of the buildings we will have in 2050 already built, new innovations to upgrade whole districts that no longer meet modern standards are now emerging. An entire positive energy block is being created in Limerick, Ireland's third largest city, as a way of reducing energy consumption within a key area of the city centre while retaining its unique Georgian heritage. Part of the Positive City Exchange project, the scheme envisions a new renewable energy management system, allowing for the two-way flow of energy with excess power returned to the grid. ICL Digital Twin Technology from IES has played a crucial part in the first phase, helping to reduce energy consumption as much as possible before the application of renewable technologies. Here, an intelligent community information model was built using data provided by the local council, OpenStreetMap and other sources. This gave the IES team an understanding of CO2 emissions as well as energy consumption and distribution across the district. Five buildings were then picked to form the positive energy block and each given its own digital twin. These virtual energy models are accurate replicas of physical buildings, using real-world data and other information obtained from physics-based simulations and machine learning algorithms. Next, small operational measures that could achieve significant energy savings were identified, such as modern heating controls, while the impact of upgrades like improved air tightness and LED lighting were calculated. Finally, the team investigated the effect of deeper actions, including replacing boilers with heat pumps and the integration of renewable energy sources, suggesting solar panels on the roof and the installation of a tidal turbine in the nearby river. Implementing all of these measures will reduce electricity demand to just 0.6 gigawatt hours per year, with the block expected to generate 1 gigawatt hour per year, a positive energy result. This process is designed to be easily replicated across other city districts worldwide, starting with one of Limerick's partner cities, Trondheim in Norway. With the scale of the climate challenge becoming more evident all the time, the need to overhaul our built environment and boost efficiency is getting increasingly urgent. But projects like these can give us hope. They show that transforming how our buildings use and also generate energy is not only possible, but that it can be achieved right now. While the construction sector has a lot of work to do if it's to turn the tide against climate change, arming the industry with cutting-edge technology and inspiring examples to follow could shift the balance in its favour after all. This video is made possible by IES. To find out how its digital twin technology is being applied on other projects and helping to hit zero carbon targets, click the link below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, subscribe to the B1M. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for this seminar. I'm Shalom David, and on behalf of Triple Lady, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will enjoy learning with us today and hope the session proves to be fruitful and engaging. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to introduce our presenter, architect Neha Das. Architect Neha Das is a research scholar from the architecture department of the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. She completed her post-graduation from the School of Planning and Architecture in Vijaywada in Sustainable Architecture and has working with the NetSed Lab of IIT Roorkee as a researcher since then. Her area of research is thermal performance of building envelopes, study of alternative building materials, and energy efficiency in buildings. Without further ado, I would like to welcome you, ma'am, to deliver your presentation. The floor is yours. Hello, hi everyone, good morning. Thank you, Shalom, for introducing. 
uh, i hope everyone is uh, like i'm audible everyone can hear me yes ma'am you are audible okay so i'll just share my screen Can you see the screen? Yes, it's visible now. <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, thermal performance of buildings in the cold climate of India, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, so yeah, I would like to take you through what is a cold climate and what happens to buildings in cold climate. and adaptation towards cold climate like how human react to cold climate inside buildings how do they build the uh, buildings differently and what is the thermal performance indicator and so inside all these things we we'll know what are the traditional techniques uh, passive and active solar strategies so what is a cold climate according to nbc which is the national building code uh the cold climate refers to the zone which has a mean monthly maximum temperature less than 25 degrees celsius and ecbc which is also a code in india energy conservation building code uh it further differentiates the cold climate into two parts cold and cloudy and cold and sunny based on the precipitation level because in uh cold and cloudy the precipitation is higher and the cold and sunny precipitation is lower than 200 mm per year and there is another code called sp41 which is a handbook on functional requirements of buildings this code is also developed by india so this describes the cold climate as the mean daily dry bulb temperature of less than 6 degree celsius prevailing through december to january because these are considered as the winter months and the altitude level of greater than 1200 meter above sea level so from this map of india which is a old map of 2005 as you can see that kashmir and le are like it's divided now but it's still there in india so uh, so uh, the states which come under the cold climate are jammu kashmir le ladakh Uh, arunachal uh, pradesh himachal pradesh uttarakhand sikkim some parts of uh, assam and nagaland and also in the southern parts there are few blotches of uh, cold climate so what happens to buildings in cold climate so as we all know that uh, heat transfer happens when there is a difference between temperature so the heat travels from higher temperature to the lower temperature so heat transfers in three different uh, mediums like conduction convection and radiation so what is conduction in terms of uh, buildings so in your house there is wall there is floor there is roof so when the outside, so in colder climate the outside air will be cooler than the inside air so the heat tends to lose through walls and roofs and floor from inside to outside because the inner layer is warm and the outer layer is cool and convection is a transfer of energy by which a physical movement of fluid in the case of gas or air and the air moves against or across the surface for example there is a wall outside and the air movement which is in meter per second is going is moving very fast so the air transfer uh, the uh, air transfer will also be very fast which is through convection then radiation radiation is a transfer of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves unlike conduction and convection radiation can happen without any contact between the heat source and the object so in our case the heat source will be the sunlight and the object will be the uh, windows or the walls so as the sun is the biggest radiator source you will want to build the house somewhere it gets direct sunlight because in colder climate we need lot of heat inside the building So what I did was I took a, a room of five by five meters 
uh, area and i simulated it in a simulation software called transis so what i did first was i took a weather file weather files are usually available in uh, ishray website as epw file formats so you can download these weather files so what is a weather file weather file consists of uh, variables like the temperature humidity the wind speed wind direction etc so when you download this uh, weather file and you put it in the simulation software and you give the building dimensions with the uh, layers of wall and roof and floor so in my case i have given it's a typical conventional building which is made up the walls are made up of brick and the roof is rcc so uh, i took the day which is december 26 uh, the uh, and at 6 am the temperature was the lowest on the whole year for Masuri. This is the weather file for Masuri. So what I did was I took the room and I am so in this figure in the left side I am showing what is the temperature inside the room and outside the room. So you can see the temperature inside the room is one degrees, one point three degrees, and outside it is minus two point four five. And all the sides of the wall, east, west, north, south, have the surface temperatures. So you can know that, okay, the heat is getting lost and the temperature inside the room is not comfortable. Like, can you stay inside a building which is one degrees? No, you cannot. So you need to do something in the wall or the floor or the roof or install some active features like in the video we saw shared by Siddharth that we can install solar PV panels, some wind energy or uh, likewise. So we can do that and enhance the thermal comfort of the building to uh, stay inside the building and have a better comfortable environment and in the second picture in the right side I am showing the temperature surface temperature of roof and floor and also the window. So this is called uh, a uh, Sankey plot S-A-N-K-E-Y so this can be used uh, in any form so I have used it to show you the heat loss and heat gain which is happening inside a building through walls, floors, and roof. So this is particularly for my case that I have taken. It may vary when you take your building for any other climate or any other dimension, or if you give any other wall assembly or roof assembly, like if you give a concrete wall or a, a ACC block wall. Uh, so like that, it will change AAC block. Sorry. So we can see that in a cold climate, the heat loss is more than the heat gain and basically the heat loss is happening in my case from the window 24 percent and the heat gain is happening from the west wall uh, 20 uh, from the west wall as 26 percent now uh, this is another case uh, uh, of the same building but in the day uh, 2 p.m so in the 2 p.m. also the inside temperature is 4 degrees. So in the whole 24 hours, it's going from 1 degree to 4 degrees. So it's not comfortable, right? So likewise, the surface temperatures are, are mentioned and the roof and wall and the window surface temperatures are mentioned. Then the heat loss and heat gain. So during the day, the heat loss is higher. Uh, it's 738 watt per meter square. Watt per meter square is the unit for heat gain or heat loss. So uh, wall or a roof or a floor or a window then how do people adapt in cold climate so there are uh, traditional techniques construction techniques which are already there uh, from regions and from tribes which uh, have developed these techniques through trial and error method or through uh, like these are the climate responsive techniques which are already there so what can we learn from them or what do we uh, take away from them so these are the regions. So I'll be explaining uh, all the techniques from each of these regions like Ladakh, Jammu, Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, and Assam. So for uh, Ladakh, the common materials that are used are uh, earth, which is the uh, soil, and the timber, which is wood. And quartzite stone is locally available there. So it is basically used for construction of forts and palaces. Then sun dried earth block, then dry grass and hay and clay plaster. So, why do they use dry glass, hay, and clay plaster? Because they need something to bind this rock and put it as a plaster. And clay as a material gives 
lot of uh, storage like when the heat transfer is happening so when the heat transfer is uh, in the cold case it goes from inside to outside so if you have a, a layer of clay which has a high thermal capacity like it can store more heat so the heat transfer will be delayed so we'll read about it uh, I'll, I'll explain about all these things in further slides i'm just explaining it right now so that when i explain it later you'll able to connect and uh, timber as you know these materials like earth and timber these are uh, poor conductors of heat so ultimately they are used because they can transfer their heat in lesser rate and they use flat roof because in Leh, Ladakh there is no uh, case of rain like there's less rainfall so they don't need to build uh, sloping roofs and then the uh, lower story is made with mud and upper story is made with timber the first floor is used for stables and second floor is used for family room. so you must be wondering why the first floor is used for stable and why second floor is for family room so stables are uh, basically uh, places where uh, animals and livestock are kept so the heat which is generated by livestock and animal is transferred from the floor to the upper floors so we have uh, heating systems like radiant panels and floors and walls so that time they did not have such active systems so they used these techniques like keeping the livestock in the first floor so that the heat can be generated from the floor and it can reach them next will be uh, Jammu and Kashmir so the two basic material uh, construction techniques that are followed in Jammu and Kashmir on the basis of uh, sesame city also because Jammu and Kashmir faces a lot of uh, earthquake uh, so dhachi diwari is a technique and dark construction technique so basically dhachi uh, diwari is a timber framing with infills of brick and stone it's like a patchwork and then dark is a load bearing masonry pile with infill walls and the basic materials are brick timber stone and mud roofs are basically pyramid nowadays they are being constructed in cgi sheet which is corrugated galvanized iron sheet and it has got a steep pitch which avoids snow and accumulation of water leakages and it is basically square and rectangular plan so why did people build square or rectangular plan or compact structure because the area to volume ratio will be less so the heat inside the building will be captured inside and it won't go outside easily so that is why they went for the square and rectangular and compact building plan so again, this is also a double story structure and ground is for sitting in bedroom, kitchen and upper floor for bedroom and storage. Yeah. So coming to Himachal Pradesh, uh, Kartpuni is a type of architectural style which is prevalent in uh, Himachal Pradesh. So it is basically built out of stone foundation and wall constructed with alternate pores of dry masonry and wood without water. So you can see in this picture that uh, these alternate wood courses are there and in between stone courses are there. So this gives them again a, a compressive strength, high compressive strength against the earthquake because in Himachal also earthquake is uh, very frequent. And the primary materials we use are wood, stone, and slate. But thal is the word which is commonly used for slate in Himachal Pradesh. And these are also double storied and sometimes triple storied also, depending on the uh, income of the uh, local people and all. Uh, so, what do they do in this kind of building? Is the ground floor is for cattle, then the first floor is for storage of granary, and then the upper floors the living and the bedroom is there and sometimes it is also mud plastered and wooden paneling is done inside the rooms. Now this is uh, in Uttarakhand, the base, the vernacular architecture style is known as Koti Banal. It is very similar to Kartpuni and, and it also uses an alternate band of uh, as you can see where the lady is standing in the walls you can see the alternate bands of wood and the houses are in linear shape and there is corridors all, all along 
the sides and basically in the long, uh, the longer side which is in the south actually what happens is people in the uh, hills they don't spend much time inside the houses they usually come outside the house they like to sit outside the sun so they so that is why this uh, corridors and balconies are built so that they can enjoy the sunlight and sit outside and go out and uh, go about their daily lives and these buildings have a low height so why do they have low height i'll also explain that in further slides too. why or uh, what happens when you uh, construct a building of this much height and what happens if you uh, reduce the height by a bit of uh, like 10 percent 20 percent then they also have pitched roof and uh, nowadays it, the uh, slates are getting convert uh, are getting replaced by cgl sheet because uh, of maintenance basically then uh, Sikkim. Sikkim has three basic uh, major tribes Lepcha, Limbu and Bhutia. So these three tribes build their own houses in their own style according to their social traditions, culture and beliefs. Uh, so basically the building material is uh, same for all three bamboo wood and uh, Lepcha has uh, courtyards and separate kitchen space because their families are large so they need a big dining space so a separate kitchen is there so with a dining kitchen and bed and Limbu have uh, the they have they pray to goddess Yuma so ha they have this pillar inside their home at the center of the house in Tokyo and the uh, Bhutia uh, house is also known as Kim K-H-I-M which is a two-story rectangular structure and here also they have uh, ground floor for cattle and there's also a technique called water end up i hope you all are aware about it and so this water end up is a woven lattice of wooden sticks with soil clay sand and animal dung so again why are they using animal dung clay soil so that time they didn't have cement and lime plasters and so they used all these are uh, locally available things to reduce the heat transfer and also uh, as bamboo cane leaves mud Lime and stone chips are primarily available, so we use that. And the roof is made up of reef thatch and mud. So these roofs have to be uh, reconstructed again and again for due to poor maintenance and uh, rainfall. Then coming to Arunachal Pradesh, the houses are basically uh, built of wooden frame with uh, surki as the binding agent and brick reinforced with bamboo, mud and cow dung, lime and beaten straw. So houses are, these houses are constructed on a raised platform because of a lot of rainfall. The rain gets inside the building and it seeps inside the wall, through the wall and the floor. So they build it in a higher platform. And the thatched and tin roofs are extended so that when the rain falls, it doesn't uh, affect the walls. They have a very small uh, windows. Uh, so window to wall ratio, which is uh, if you have a wall, and if you have a window, so the window to wall ratio is the area of the window by the area of the wall that is known as the window to wall ratio. If you go through standards like NBC, uh, National Building Board, ECDC, and so on, they have some prescribed uh, window to wall ratio for different climate zones. So here they have 15% for Arunachal Pradesh. Then coming to Nagaland, uh, they have elongated rectangular houses with, a, uh, with elongated rectangular plan. The primary material is wood, bamboo and thatch. Uh, so these are the areas which is neutral, private, semi-private and public. <coughs> so what happens in all these four areas? So the front room, uh, which is the public room, is where the rice pounding tables were kept. Because in Nagaland, they have their livelihood is based on farming rice. So in the front room, they have rice uh, pounding tables. Then in the second, which is the semi-private uh, area, there's a narrow room for unmarried girls of the household that they sleep. Then in the third, which is the private, is where the head of the family and his wife sleeps. And the fourth, which is the neutral uh, area, here the liquor room where rice beer is stored in bamboo chops. So this uh, division of area is according to the culture, belief and the societal norms. That is why it is there. Uh, but overall the sloping roof and thatch with bamboo grass at very low roofs, all these are very common in all these uh, cold climate zones. 
from coming to assam the vernacular house is known as chan house uh, it has got again the real spirits for uh, the rainfall and the water room uh, it's got the floor and walls and it has got a big hall with central kitchen and there's another type of house in uh, assam which is called the ikra house so it is basically uh, made out of bamboo thatch and Now, what are some climate responsive features? As we have already seen through examples that uh, some buildings were oriented uh, towards the south, some walls were insulated with clay, and some walls were constructed out of stone to increase the width of the wall so that the mass increases and the heat transfer is delayed. So these are some techniques which were evolved throughout the time. So I'll just explain according to the case study that I had taken, the one which where I had built a a five by five room. So some uh, so some active solar strategies like uh, if we have solar collectors on roof, which uh, like PV panels, they collect the uh, uh, energy from the sunlight and convert it into heat energy and supply it for water heating systems. Or they can go for uh, as in the left side, you can see the radiating heat radiating panels inside floor or inside walls. Uh, so uh, the passive features are like insulated wall. So the insulation can be present inside the wall or outside the wall. That also depends like where you have to, you have also to think where you have to give the insulation because uh, if you give outside and inside, there will be a difference of uh, the heat transfer in terms of time. Like how much time does it take for the indoor temperature to go up or down as per the outside temperature. So in my case, uh, in colder climate, we have to give the insulation outside because that is better than giving it inside. So when I gave the insulation in my wall, the insulation that I have used is XPS. So uh, given that, I, I got a 10% reduction in the heating energy system. So why are we doing this thermal performance? Why are we putting insulated wall, wooden floor and all these things? Because ultimately, we want to reduce the energy consumption inside buildings. Uh, because nowadays we use a lot of uh, uh, electrical systems like heaters, air pumps, and uh, in, uh, split air systems. So to reduce the energy consumption, we need to uh, tweak the building or retrofit the building or make a uh, assembly in such a manner so that the heating of energy consumption is reduced. Uh, then if I give a wooden flooring, so in my case, the energy reduces by 8%. And if I give thermal mass, the thermal mass here uh, can mean also the, if I am using, for example, in the first case, I am using a brick wall of uh, 230 uh, uh, centimeter, and if I am uh, sorry, 23 point 23 centimeters, and if I am using a, a brick wall of uh, a bit higher uh, thickness, uh, which is larger than 23 then it will also be termed as thermal mass because I'm increasing the thickness of the building or I can go for a uh, material like uh, uh, random rubble masonry which can also uh, be termed as a, th a, thermal, a, low, a high thermal mass material. So it reduces further the uh, heating consumption by 5%. Then I can replace the windows by single glaze, double glaze and double glazed with argon, with air, with krypton. So in my case, I have used a double glazed unit with air because not everyone can afford uh, going for a DGU with uh, krypton and argon because it is costly also. So I'm just going for the normal solution, the economical solution. So I get a 5% reduction of that. And if I use an insulated roof, so again, this year I have used uh, the insulation material as XPS, which is available in uh, different various thicknesses ranging from uh, 10 mm to 100 mm. Yeah, so I have used 25 mm insulation, so I get a 14% reduction. Then if I use dark exterior, if I paint my wall in a dark color, then what happens is the heat is stored for a longer time. So that gives me a 9% reduction. Then there are other techniques uh, like active, uh, like attic, uh, which if you give an attic, so you can see in the picture that the warm air stays within the zone and the cold air stays within the attic. So that also delays the heat transfer between the attic and the home. Then a sun space is a space uh, 
which is an extended hole uh, built out of the walls are built out of glass and uh, sunlight flaps the, the this room flaps the energy from the sun and heats up that space and transfer the heat slowly slowly inside the zone where the people are staying so sun space is very useful in home then you can always orient your building towards south where you can give uh, solar panels facing south and also with the longer axis is towards south then you will have more heat gain inside the building then there's a sloping roof so sloping roofs are used basically for two reasons one is for uh, get, uh, getting out the snow and the rainfall and also they should uh, they help in not destroying the walls and uh, windows so that is why we use sloping roof in Kota. Then trombe wall. Trombe wall is a massive wall that is painted in a dark color in order to absorb thermal energy from the incident sunlight and uh, covered with a glass on the outside with an insulating air gap between the wall and the glazer. This creates an air compartment where the air is heated, then allowed in and out of the house through the vents. You can see there are two vents at the bottom and the top. And so the trombe walls work by trapping heat from the sun. Then low ceiling height. You remember in the vernacular techniques we have seen that every building had a uh, low ceiling height. So why is that? Uh, because uh, if you like, I simulated it and I saw that if you reduce the ceiling height by ten centimeter, you get one percent reduction. So each ten centimeter reduction in ceiling height will give you extra one percent of heating energy reduction. Then coming to thermal performance indicators. Uh, so what are thermal performance indicators and why do we need it? Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the process of modeling an energy transfer between the building and the surrounding to check the temperature variation within the building refers to the thermal performance. So what happens in a building? Uh, like you can see the image in the right hand side. This is an image of a thermal camera. Okay, this is uh, uh, given by uh, Testo. Testo is a company which produces uh, such products like thermal image cameras. So if you can see in the image, uh, it gives us the thermal image of a facade where we can identify the defects in the building, like where the infiltration is happening. Like, is there an air leakage? Because in India, we know that uh, the constructions are the facades and the buildings are not very uh, uh, like they have they tend to uh, be leaky so the windows and the room uh, and the walls and the roofs in between there are leaks in that zone so you can detect those leaks and you can correct those leaks through uh, this thermal image camera so you can also use this thermal image camera to know how the building is performing and where the leakage is at. so there are two states called steady state and dynamic state so steady state is something where uh, we consider all the variables and the time as constant. Throughout the time, it will be constant. For example, uh, there is this term called U value, which is calculated as a steady state uh, indicator because the indoor and outdoor temperature is taken as constant throughout the time. And there is this dynamic state, like you know, building and the weather tends to uh, change from the whole day like in the day it will be different temperature night will be different season while also it is different temperatures so uh, so there are few indicators which uh, are uh, which help in knowing the dynamic state and there are few indicators which help in the steady state and this particular graph which is in the right hand side it is a comfort analysis graph where if you know okay, what is the comfortable temperature inside the building. For example, in my case, this is Masuri. So in Masuri, the comfortable temperature is 17 and 26 degrees Celsius. So within this range, people feel comfortable. So how did I get this range? How did I land up at the 17 and not 15 or 13 or 18? Or, and why 26? So there's this uh, uh, comfortable range of formula which is present in a few, the, few of the course. If you want, I can explain it in 
next session or next class or if you want that. Uh, so it's a bit uh, tricky to understand right now, but there's a formula where you have to give the inside temperature of the zone and it will give you, okay, this is the comfortable range plus minus five degrees plus minus two degrees. So this is the comfortable range. So below the comfortable range is uh, where I have to install the heating system. And if goes if it goes above the comfortable range, then I have to install a AC. So I can see for Masuri, the fifty six point one percentage of time of the whole year it is below comfortable range, and uh, th only for thirty nine point five percentage of time is for comfortable range. Now, how did I make this uh, map? So as I know that there are students from all the years, so I would uh, like to show you an application. Uh, is my screen visible to all of you? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Oh, so there's this uh, website uh, called andrewmarsh.com. So it has a lot of softwares where you can do simulations for dynamic, uh, dynamic daylighting, when you can view your uh, uh, temperature weather files and you can do like whatever you want so you can explore it but i'm just going to explain this one data view so i'll just launch this so this is how the interface looks like and so here you have to download your weather file you have to load your weather file it has to be in epw format so I'm not downloading anything, I'm just taking London. So these four weather files are already given. I'm just taking London. Yeah. So if you download this weather file and uh, you will you can get all these variables and you can see in the graph driver temperature, dew point, relative humidity, atmosphere, all the variables which are there in the APW file will be given here. So you can also change it if you want to see okay, what is, I just want to know what is happening in the month of May. You can decrease or increase this bar and you can see okay, what is what is the range of temperature in London in the month of May and what is, is uh, direct solar and normal radiation, how, how much is it in the month of May. You can check all these things, like if you want this to show charge, See that if you have relative humidity, see this. So you can do all these things in this uh, particular software. So what I'm going to explain is how do I, how did I get that comfort chart? So this is something called calculate comfort. So you go there. So it takes up the file. Uh, So I can adjust this comfortable range, which I got through that formula, which needs to input the indoor temperature. So I can just change this from, for example, now it is 18, I can change And likewise, so it can give me, it automatically calculates the, how much percentage of time is below comfort, how much is within and how much is above. So there's also a formula to calculate all these things, but this software makes it easier. Like if you don't want to go into the difficulties of calculation, how much degree hours and how many hours are comfortable to the comfort, so you can easily get to this software. And you can also explore that there are various things inside this. So coming back to the presentation. Uh, so before going into uh, thermal performance, uh, we should always check key whether the building needs heating, whether the building needs cooling, or whether it is comfortable. It doesn't need anything. So these are some uh, uh, thermal performance indicators which are readily available. Uh, for in, in, there's a, a book called Eco Nivas Samhita by B. E. E. So that also prescribes few thermal indicators, then NBC and SP41, as I have already explained. The first is U value. U value is a indicator of steady state analysis. Like it uh, assumes that the outside and the inside temperature of the ball is steady throughout the year and throughout the time of the day. Uh, so the 
two things that are required to uh, the three things that are required to calculate new value is L, K, and H O H I. L is the thickness of the material, or like if there is a wall assembly, it is made up of brick and plasters. So, what is the thickness of the brick? What is the thickness of the plaster? So, it requires the conductivity. So, you can find this conductivity, density, specific capacity. All of them are available in uh, MBC, in uh, ECBC, and then also SP formula. So you can just put all these values and in this formula and you can get the answer. So for HO and HI, this is the outside and inside uh, heat transfer coefficients. You have to use these coefficients also carefully. It depends on the climate also. For cold climate, these coefficients are different. And for all the other climate zones of India, these uh, coefficients are different for roof. And for wall, it is same for all the climates. Uh, yeah, so if you get so for a brick wall of 230 mm with clusters, the U value varies from uh, 2 to 2.8 uh, watt per meter square, depending on what type of brick is there. And uh, then, then comes to then we come to the second indicator called thermal time constant, which is uh, termed as a uh, which is calculated in terms of hours. Uh, so what happens is if you take a brick wall and if you put insulation inside and outside, you remember I was explaining to why is it important to know ki where should we put the insulation, whether it should be outside or whether it should be inside. So this is an uh, indicator which helps you to know ki where you should put your insulation. Should it be inside or should it be outside? So this indicator's unit is hours. So how many hours does it take for the indoor temperature to go up or the indoor temperature to go down according to the outside prevailing conditions? So this formula here uses the conductivity, the thickness, the density, and the specific heat capacity so of the material. And if it is a multiple uh, wall, uh, with multiple layers like brick, cement, and uh, some insulation, so you can just uh, add all the uh, uh, layers, ka, uh, thickness and density and you can get the value. So this will all, always be in terms of R. So you can know ki if my out, if I give the insulation outside, that is helpful or if I give the insulation inside. So the, so the uh, U value of the wall and the roof will be same because you are using the same materials. As you can see, the materials, the uh, thickness and the conductivity will be same. So the U value will be same for both the walls, but the position of the insulation will differ the hours that can be there for the time, uh, which is the time which is the, uh, which can be there for the heat to transfer from inside to outside or outside to inside. Then we have this uh, book called Eco Nila Samhita, as I was explaining to you. This is a recent document uh, produced in 2018. This is only for residential buildings. So you can use this particular formula for uh, calculating the residential and the transmittance value. So here what is there, there are three things. Uh, one is for the opaque and two are for non-opaque. Opaque here refers to walls and non-opaque here refers to windows and skylights. So A, B and C. What are A, B and C? A, B, Cs are the climate uh, coefficients. For example, in compass, for example, if my if I have a residence in compass of climate, then I'm going to use these three coefficients in place of A, B, C for my builders, for my residential building. And A is the A opaque is the area of the wall. Then U is the U value, and omega here refers to the projection factor. Now, how so the uh, yeah, uh, the orientation factor. So how will we get the omega value? Uh, so for omega, what we do is uh, we first see ki where the orientation of the wall or the window is. Is it in the north or in the east? So we get a value from there. And also we see where in the building is located in which latitude. Is it uh, above uh, 23.5 degree north or is it below 23.5 degree So we take up a value from here and the pf which is the projection factor of the overhang which uh, which can be used in the sfgc like 
this omega value you can directly get from here in this table and this and this SFGC equivalent when you have to find out the SFGC equivalent from the window for that you can use this projection factor projection factor is nothing but the uh, length of the overhang by the length of the uh, from the window to the overhang so this is called the projection factor it can also be found for the fins if you have a side fin on the right side or the left side so you can find that so the total uh, ESF will be the overhang plus the side fin and the, uh, then for the side fin the formula is this if you have a left and a right and the total SHGC, SHGC is the solar heat gain coefficient uh, yeah so uh, the solar heat gain coefficient can be found out for the unshaded into the ESF of total which is this one so for unshaded you can get it from NBC uh, it is prescribed there for each of the climate zones it is there and this is the orientation factor as I was telling that if for example from the PF overhand out of this formula this PF you found out okay my PF is uh, the height by the this V H by V is coming under this range it's less than 0 0.1 and my uh, window is facing towards north so you have to use this one and uh, so this table is particularly for the uh, latitude which is greater than 23.5 so you can find such tables in Ikonava Samhita where there is uh, tables for all the other la uh, the latitudes lesser than 23.5 degrees or 23.5 degrees now. yeah so this is an RETV formula for the buildings which have uh, which are available which are located in all the climate zones except cold climate so for cold climate, what do they have is U value, U value for uh, envelope, which is walls, and U value for roof. So the prescribed benchmark for uh, envelope for uh, U value is 1.8 watt per meter square, for roof it is 1.2, and RETV is 50. So you have to reach near this uh, value to be energy efficient and have a better thermal performance of your building. And if you can also always go for lesser new values, but this is the bench. Yeah. Next is time lag. So these three uh, indicators, time lag, damping, and decrement factor, basically sees how much time is taken for the heat to transfer from inside to outside, from inside to outside or outside to inside. So time lag is basically the time where the maximum peak occurs minus the time when uh, the ma uh, the maximum inside minimum and maximum of outside and inside occurs maximum of outside and maximum of inside for example uh, the outside temperature goes maximum at uh, 3 pm and the inside goes maximum at 6 pm so there will be a 3 hours time lag between that then what is thermal damping thermal damping is also an indicator which is dynamic in nature because it takes into account the delta T of the indoor temperature, delta T is the uh, uh, difference between the maximum and minimum of indoor temperature and outdoor temperature. TO refers to outdoor and TI refers to indoor. So maximum and minimum of outdoor minus maximum and minimum of indoor divided by maximum and minimum of outdoor into 100. It is uh, the unit is percentage. So for damping, uh, from thermal damping, you can know okay, this is the percentage of damping uh, that is there. Uh, so you can know uh, how much damping is required. For example, if your building is in a cold climate, so how much damping is required for the temperature to be in that comfortable range? Then we come to decrement factor. So decrement factor is a ratio which describes the ability of the envelope in reducing its peak inside surface temperatures. The decrement factor represents the relationship between the indoor and the outdoor daily temperature zones. Uh, so here you, you have to take the uh, surface temperature of walls, for example, uh, the maximum temperature of wall and minus the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature outside the wall minus the minimum temperature outside the wall. So this is a factor, it doesn't have any unit. Then 
then lastly we uh, last but not the least we have uh, envelope performance factor uh, this is described by ECDC and also NBC. This is not for residential building, it is only for commercial buildings. Uh, so, as we had seen in RETV, that there are three things uh, for the one for roof, one for wall, and one for fenestration. Here, they have also there for we have for roof. And uh, similarly, here, like there, we had A, B, C uh, for the climate coefficients, and here we have C as the climate coefficient like c ka coefficient values will be available in these codes that i mentioned uh, according to if it's the composite climate if it's the cold climate warm climate, and so on and mw is the multiplier of sgc like we found out that uh, projection factor and orientation factor so this m is also the values of m are also available so if you put all the values inside this formula you'll get an epf so what is the importance of EPF is first, the EPF uh, coefficients and values all are available. So first you make a building and you put these particular values and that becomes your base case. Okay, this is my standard building values. Then if you tweak or retrofit the wall or the roof or the window, then the EPF values, the coefficients will change according to the orientation and everything. So you will have a reduction of the EPF uh, value of the a retrofitted building over the standard building, so you will get a reduced value. So that is how this EPF is used, which is another performance factor. Then last factor, the uh, last indicator is called the thermal performance index. The thermal performance index is a uh, uh, indicator which uses the indoor temperature. So TIS is the indoor surface temperature of a wall minus 30 into 100 by 8. So 30 is basically the temperature benchmark above which if it goes then the, the comfortable temperature will be not comfortable enough. So that is why 30 is taken and into 100 divided by 8. So these are the typical uh, naturally ventilated values. If your TPI is uh, below or equal to 75 and then it comes as class A which is good and the required uh, temperature inside the building will be uh, of the surface will be 36 degrees so if you have 36 degrees of temperature surface temperature of wall that means the comfortable temperature inside the room will be automatically uh, comfortable because you remember when i showed the first slide where i had shown that in my building according to the walls what is the surface temperature inside so the surface temperature of walls and roofs uh, all, always influence the comfort the temperature inside the zone. So if you have a 36 degree temperature surface wall, then the comfortable temperature inside the room will be comfortable according to that particular climate zone. So uh, likewise, the TPI classifies the building from A to E. So if you have a, a TPI value which is greater than 225, then the building will be extremely poor. Uh, so likewise, you can also go for a corrected TPI. Corrected TPI is nothing but uh, you introduce some correction factors for wall, roof, orientations, external surface finish, and shading on wall and roof. Uh, so, if you have, a, a, for example, a wall in a hot and dry climate or a warm and humid climate, then there are corrected TPI coefficients like C. C is the coefficient for wall in hot and dry climate or in warm and humid or in uh, cold climate. So, for cold climate, the coefficients are not available. So, you cannot use TPI uh, for cold climate, but uh, as you will design buildings throughout your uh, five years of architecture in different climate zones, that is why I'm telling you about TPI. So, you can use this indicator for uh, knowing what is the thermal performance of the uh, building that, that you have made. So, according to the roof and the orientation also, and then external surface finish also you can know whether the coefficient then shading if it is shaded or unshaded then the coefficients are available uh, so you can use this coefficient in this formula and get the corrected TPI. so for example if i am using a wall uh, with an in a hot dry climate and the roof is also there orientation everything is there so what you do is you calculate each and then add everything like you calculate the corrected TPI first for wall then roof in orientation and you add everything inside that then you get the final picture.
So why did we study about different thermal performance indicators? We could have only studied about U value because that is mentioned there in every other uh, building codes. So why did we read about U value? Why did we read about uh, thermal time constant? Why did we read about damping? Why did we read about TPI? Because uh, sometimes what happens is if the same building uh, with same construction material will give you different different uh, PPI or damping or a thermal time constant. So the only thing that will that, that can vary is maybe the thickness or the insulation that is present inside or outside. So all these happens inside a building and these indicators are very useful to understand what is the thermal comfortable temperature inside the building, how is the building going to affect. Because obviously your first instinct should always be to reduce the heat energy consumption through passive features and then go for active features and uh, you should not always think of first installing the okay I'll ha I have an AC I'll install or I have a heater I'll install that no first you should make your building or design your building as such as you can reduce that uh, like I'll show this yeah this below comfort temperature you can reduce this by uh, doing such tweakings in your walls and roofs and as much as you reduce this as and the energy consumption for your heating devices will reduce. So obviously, I'm not uh, telling you you can never uh, use heating systems or cooling really systems. Ultimately, sometimes you have to use, but you can always reduce the energy consumption. Okay, so I'm ready to take up any questions. If Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your informative and interesting talk. So we will move on to the Q&A session. How can we restore the initial conditions of thermal comfort in a historic building? How can we restore? How can we restore the initial conditions of thermal comfort in a historic building? I whoever has asked this question, I would like to ask, uh, ask them, ki, uh, why do you think the uh, buildings in vernacular, uh, traditional buildings or vernacular buildings are not, uh, like, they don't have, they don't achieve that kind of thermal comfort or they don't have that uh, uh, like comfortable performance. So why do you think that, like, why did you ask this question? Ma'am, maybe because they thought that uh, they wouldn't adapt to the current scenarios of, like, of um, climate change or whatever. Okay. okay. Yeah, actually, I'll tell you my first hand experience. Uh, so there's this place called Chakrata, which is there in Uttarakhand. It's uh, two hours away from Masuri. So there, the buildings are built with uh, this Koti Banal architectural style, which I already explained it to you. Yeah. So what happens is in Chakrata, due to this onset of climate change and emerging material, building material of uh, like the CGI sheets and uh, uh, brick and concrete and everything. So right now, people are building with this new emerging material, they are not building uh, buildings with stone and slate and all these things because also there's another reason that the skilled masons and laborers and artisans are not available now. Everyone is leaving the place, uh, the rural areas and going to urban areas. Uh, but you will not believe that when I went to these homes, they don't have any kind of heater. Like we have radiators, we have blowers in our homes with if we are staying in cold climate. So they don't have anything. They just wear normal the sweaters and shawl and everything. And they stay inside this home and it is very comfortable. They don't need any heater. You know why? Because inside their homes, they also have a kitchen inside their home. So this produces the heat and also the heat is uh, released by cattle, which is in the ground floor and also the people. So uh, if you think that the traditional techniques are not performing due to climate change or due to emergence of uh, new materials, so it's not like that. Because we are introducing uh, 
the new materials, the thermal performance of buildings are getting depreciated. So that is why uh, uh, when we are building new uh, buildings, so we need to construct a composite building which has the vernacular techniques and also the emerging new materials and techniques. So that is why uh, uh, people nowadays are not building uh, the vernacular buildings because of uh, no availability of uh, uh, local artisans, masons and skilled labors. And also materials have become very costly. Like uh, when I went to Chakrata, so they were saying mm -hmm. that slate, which is also known as Pathal, uh, they used to get that free of cost usually because it was locally available. But now uh, the government has imposed uh, high prices on wood, on slate. So that is why they are not using it. Plus it has to be maintained every season because it rains and snows so heavily that they have to change it. And as the CGI sheets or this uh, GI sheets, these are very cheap. So they use that in place of roof. Then so I asked them, Ki, okay, you have also stayed in a uh, vernacular house and you have also stayed in a building where you have replaced the roof. So what difference do you notice? So they said the only advantage is that we don't have to replace the roof in every season when the winter comes and the snowfall is there or when the rain is heavy. But we are not experiencing that comfort which we used to experience when we had the roof made out of uh, purlins, rafters, timber and that slate roof. So yeah, to answer your question, the, uh, due to climate change, is there a change in the old buildings? Uh, no, they are still performing the same. It's just that we have uh, adapted to new buildings, so we are tweaking the buildings. So we need to be conscious the what, uh, how mu how much amount of tweaking can be done, and it should be aligned with the uh, society, the culture, the beliefs of that particular uh, state or the area, and we should design it accordingly. With regards to the orientation of buildings, which is the best in respect to its width or length, like, or when it's oriented towards north, south, or east, west? Uh, can you repeat the question? With regards to the orientation of buildings, which mm -hmm. is the best in respect to its width or length? Okay. So uh, I'll explain it according to the context of cold climate. So in cold climate, what happens is uh, to build the buildings in hill in hills. So the hills are cut in steps. So the hills. Uh, so if you place the buildings in the southern part of the hill, so what happens is the sun travels from east to west, going to uh, through the south southern direction. So if you place uh, the buildings in the south side of the hill, it receives large amount of uh, sunlight and the radiation, uh, which is acceptable in a building in cold climate because you need a lot of radiation. So if you place your building, the elongated part is towards the south, then it is very uh, good in comparison if you place the building in east-west axis, like the longer part is in the east and the shorter part is in the north and south. So if you have to place your building in the uh, the longer part should be in the south, the southern side and the northern side and the shorter part should be in the east or west. What is the most effective way to increase thermal comfort or performance in a building? What is the most effective way? See, yes. there is no uh, one particular way that you can uh, install and say, okay, okay, yeah, this is the best way. You have to see that, uh, see, for example, I'll show you this one. So why did I show you this, this heat loss and heat gain? So that I can know, okay, okay, this is the particular place where heat loss is happening or the heat gain is happening. So if my building is in a warm and humid climate, I will see ki where the heat gain is happening. So first I have to do these uh, small trial and error to see uh, which part of the building or which element of the building is uh, highly influential for heat gain or highly uh, is conducting the heat loss. So, for example, if I uh, know, ki, okay, this win uh, window says, uh, like from the window, the heat loss is happening more. So, I need to do something about the window. But if I do, if I change the window only and not change the wall, it will be uninsulated. Then also, I won't get a particular uh, thermal performance index, uh, thermal performance rating, or I might not get the thermal comfort temperature. So, I have to do 
little bit of everything or like i have to see ki how much it also depends on economy also if i can afford or if i cannot afford if i cannot afford a, a switching from a single frame window to a double frame window a double glazed window then i i won't be going to that uh, going through that option but if i have that uh, monitor monitor available where i can tweak the wall or the roof i can if i can renovate the wall i can renovate the roof then i can go for that so first you have to see through simulations ki which part of the building or the element of the building is affecting the heat loss or the heat gain and you have to tweak that first so that will be the major component to reduce the heat gain or the heat loss and um as a result you will get a comfortable temperature of an environment inside a building so it's not one particular method that you will just tweak the window or you just tweak the wall you have to first see ki how the building is behaving what particular element is adding to that heat or losing heat compared to the conventional methods like rcc or brick buildings are these cold climate adaptive methods of construction costlier and are they equally durable uh the methods of vernacular are actually it is costlier because of the government rules which are there right now as i said the people used to uh, like for wood for example for wood so now there there now there is there are a lot of rules and regulations to cut down wood and to use it for construction uh, also uh, so that is why nowadays building uh, making a building with vernacular techniques using wood timber and slate is is a bit costlier so yeah nowadays building vernacular is a bit costlier than building rcc and cement because see for uh, uh, for producing for make, making a building out of brick brick is very easily available and you will get skilled local artisans and masons and uh, laborers but uh, for making these kind of structure it becomes costly With the advan with the advancement in technology, what is the future of thermal performance of buildings? Advancement of technology. What is the future of thermal performance in buildings? Yes. Uh, can you, I mean, uh, explain it further? Like whoever has asked this question, like exactly what they are wanting. As in, are there any new technologies that can be implemented in respect to building performance? like instead of vernacular methods can other new technologies yes yes definitely because nowadays there is a material called uh, uh, pcm uh, which is uh, which is like which generates like uh, when the heat light gets into that particular uh, material it uh, either it, it, it's a very smart material Uh, i think you already have a session for smart material you already gone through that so there are materials emerging building materials which are upcoming which are smart and nature which are uh, responsive to heat sunlight wind so uh, if you make the building using these technical advanced technologies then obviously your thermal performance will be uh, better than if you use the traditional methods But okay, always, it, yeah, but always it uh, boils down to cost because you uh, you have to be like if you can afford it. Okay. One last question: How do you enhance people awareness towards energy com- consumption in their own buildings? Okay, so as a part of my uh, PhD, I'm so involved with in a project in uh, with NMHS, which is the National Mission for Himalayan Housing. uh we are studies so in that uh, project what we are doing is uh, we are uh, studying this thermal performance of buildings in cold climate so we are going to uh, like whatever uh, the outcome of this project will be what we are doing is we are going to demonstrate this uh, retrofit ideas or techniques in a example building which will be going to be constructed and also we are going to uh deliver this kind of webinars and uh, seminars we're going to take for capacity building for uh, the people to be aware and we are also involved with a lot of stakeholders from government and the uh, people the local people so we visit places we tell them and we give them seminars we write reports uh, we circulate that and some of it is already available online 
so yeah that is the way we are making people aware uh, government is also like doing a very uh, like plays a major role for it and uh, yeah they have been us a lot Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure many of us have a better understanding about the thermal performance and efficiency of buildings in cold climates. We will post a recording of this webinar on our college website in a few days. There's always room for a new idea, a new step, and a new beginning. So before wrapping up the session, I would like to take the opportunity on behalf of the entire Triple AD team to heartily thank respected Neha, ma'am, for sharing your valuable time with us and educating us towards the better future. Teamwork is the ability to work together towards a common vision. I would like to thank architect Sudhat sir and architect Kishan sir, the webinar coordinators, architect Harshita ma'am, the broadcasting coordinator. Would also like to thank our principal Ganesh Babu sir, without whom this session would not be possible. Thank you sir for introducing us to various speakers around the globe and giving us the exposure. A special mention to Aditya group of institutions for always being kind and generous in accepting our requests. Lastly, I would also like to thank our participants and all the students. It is indeed an honor to be the moderator for today's webinar with such immense